Hello, everybody. It's time for another collaborative take on some naval history. So today I have with me Armoured Carriers of the uh, website of the same name. It's a very excellent website. I suggest uh, you go and have a look at it, which, um, as the name suggests, evaluates the performance and uh, damage proof dash damage recovery of the various Armoured Carriers of the Royal Navy, amongst others and uh, eventually I believe is looking at expanding into some of the other uh, armoured aircraft carriers of other navies such as Taiho. But uh, yeah, that, that aside, he's obviously done a lot of work and a lot of research into the this particular branch of naval history, and so we thought we'd, we'd have him along to talk about one particular incident, which was the bombing of HMS Illustrious during Operation Excess which was the wonderfully titled, if uh, somewhat more mundane, convoy operation in 1941 in the Mediterranean, one of many. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, thank you. Uh, do, you, do you want to maybe uh, introduce yourself a little bit more? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, look, I'm, uh, I guess uh, I'm very briefly, this has sort of been a bit of a, a hobby slash obsession of mine uh, for, for, oh shit, almost 20 years now. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, I sort of, you know, I'm Australian, so I grew up hearing all about um, how Australia was saved at the Battle of Coral Sea and um, the uh, major successes and uh, of the US Navy's um, carriers, and they were a major um, part of my youth growing up. I was always reading about the um, the different US carriers and their designs and their operations and their and their missions. And just occasionally, you'd sort of come across one or two sentences here or there relating to the Royal Navy carriers, but uh, never much more than that. Um, but come the late 1990s, there was a whole string of really interesting books about Franklin and Bunker Hill. And again, there were a few um, castaway sentences in those books relating to an incident which they compare, were comparing themselves to, which was the bombing of HMS Illustrious. And uh, I got somewhat frustrated uh, at the lack of information about that incident. So I decided to find it for myself. And from there, I've got this um, multiple dozens of pages website um, looking at all the various um, comings and goings and actions and reactions of uh, the Royal Navy's um, fleet carriers. Okay. Very nice, and obviously we're going to we'll look at one particular aspect today. So, as with uh, most of the other videos that we've done in this format, I will be asking questions and uh, pitching in with a, occasional bits of commentary, maybe some subsidiary questions as well. Uh, but since you're obviously the one who's done by far the more in-depth research on this particular bit, um, it will be mostly the information coming from yourself. So. Make sure you keep uh, keep me on track by uh, asking those questions. Otherwise, I might uh, end up end up rambling off down a uh, side street. So, <laughs> well, that's always always good. We always encourage uh, side rambles of naval history here. So, um, we, we'll start off with the the first question. So, setting the scene somewhat before Operation Excess. Obviously, we know Illustrious had well had been the carrier that was present for the relatively successful attack on Taranto. But what had Illustrious been getting up to between Taranto and her assignment to Operation Excess? Well, this was pretty much um, the high point of Royal Navy pre-war carrier doctrine. Um, they saw the use of its carriers uh, in the Mediterranean, as opposed to the Pacific, where it had a completely different doctrine. But in the Mediterranean and, the, and in the North Atlantic, the carriers were essentially floating cap bases, I suppose, although at the time they called them umbrellas. And uh, cap was a, a bit more of a later development when you had very extensive um, fighter control rooms and radar tracking, radar plots. But uh, at this point, they still had the rudimentary uh, fighter tracking and fighter direction, but it was um, still just basically aircraft above the fleet being vectored towards contacts. Um, Illustrious, immediately upon its arrival, in the Mediterranean proved the value of this uh, doctrine, <laughs> sitting in among the battleships and cruisers. Any time a um, reconnaissance aircraft was spotted on radar, her full Mars were redirected to either shoot it down or scare it off. And um, so for the first time since the outbreak of war in the Mediterranean, the 
Royal Navy had essentially a bubble of air control around its fleet wherever it went. So therefore it was much more happy uh, to, shall we say, put itself in the way of danger a little bit more so than it had previously. So yeah, so she, she's basically protecting the fleet, uh, maybe conducting the odd strike against whatever targets become available. Um, but obviously her, her main role at this point is fleet defence. So fleet, fleet defence and support, yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah. her ASW aircraft would be you know, floating, uh, uh, scouting the perimeter, but also occasionally taking the odd um, torpedo run against uh, Italian torpedo, uh, Italian convoys if they were anywhere nearby. Also dropping flares for um, any sort of bombardment mission at night uh, and the likes. But primarily, yes, just a essentially a um, floating air superiority ship. Mm -hmm. So. In that vein, what was her role being assigned to Operation Excess, the the convoy run that she was she was uh, put onto at this point? So yeah, pretty much exactly that. Uh, Excess wasn't actually a mundane um, convoy. It was actually one of the biggest convoys of the war altogether. It was um, the realization through British intelligence that um, the Germans were coming, that they were not just sending. Uh, bombers and fighters to Sicily, but they're also planning on sending Rommel into North Africa. So they realised that uh, Malta would likely soon be in trouble, and they realised that uh, fairly soon the centre of the Mediterranean would be blocked off. So they tried one last big rush of convoys from Gibraltar to Malta and to Alexandria, and from Alexa Alexandria to Malta and to Gibraltar. So both directions. So coming up from Alexandria was... Um, the uh, fleet, I think it was Force A, with uh, Illustrious and the two modernised Queen Elizabeth battleships, Queen Elizabeth and, uh, sorry, uh, it was a Valiant and um, Warspite. Um, and from the other direction, it was Ark Royal, um, covered with Renown and uh, various other vessels. So they were both covering convoys towards Malta. And the carriers were doing their job of um, interdicting um, reconnaissance to prevent and disrupt any follow-up attacks. And if follow-up attacks were detected, then their, while their full Mars weren't likely to, uh, to be able to chop them all out of the sky, they could most certainly disrupt any high-altitude bombing runs or any uh, low-altitude uh, torpedo runs. Right. And I suppose that leads us on to then the next question, which is that obviously the uh, Italians and the Germans had a rather distinct desire to make sure these convoys did not arrive at Malta, at least intact. So what was the first opposition that Illustrious encountered and how did her air group and her umbrella of full Mars cope with that? So there was actually a little bit more than just excess because at this point, um, Mussolini and Hitler were somewhat irritated at Illustrious. Um, Taranto had been a rather rude shock and pretty much the direct order to the commander of Flieger Corps 10 was to sink the illustrious. That was his primary goal. Um, disrupting the, re the reinforcement of Malta was uh, a nice secondary objective, but um, illustrious was what they wanted. So to that end, they sent Stukas, Heinkel 111s, and JU-88s to Sicily. They built out of uh, floating buoys and uh, streamers and the likes just off the coast, an outline of Illustrious's hull, and they practiced bombing it. Um, that was such was the intent of getting Illustrious. It was revenge. Um, basically, from the moment Illustrious left and Force A left Alexandria, uh, the um, the shadowers began to follow. And the Fulmars look. The, the problem with the Fulmar was if it wasn't already in position over the fleet, it had difficulty intercepting the um, fast uh, JU-88s in particular, but also the um, Italian reconnaissance aircraft, because it needed the speed of a dive. It, it had atrocious climb, climb rate, but it had a very good dive rate. So on those instances when the um, shadowers were spotted while there was a cap up, it would often get shot down. If the shadower was spotted before the full Mars were in position, it would be able to make a pass over the fleet and head back home. There's a few shadowers, maybe a few uh, scattered attacks by the odd, bo odd bomber here or there, but 
but nothing that they couldn't handle up until the uh, the 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 main event, shall we say? When yeah, the, the uh, main event was yeah January ten. The, 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 the two days prior to that, it was mostly just uh, the odd reconnaissance, and you know, from memory, there might have been a, you know, a small raid here or there. Yes. But uh, it was all very um, piecemeal up until that point. January 10 was definitely the day when um, Illustrious and Force A, and to a point, Ark Royal and uh, Renown and uh, Force H were in range of the shorter range aircraft, such as the Ju 87s and the um, the Heinkels. Mm. And of They're course, the, yeah, and of course, so this is when the the main event happens. When uh, I think it's something like two to three squadrons of Flieger Corps ten. In Stukas show up pretty much at the same time. Yes, but that's that, that happens halfway through the day. So there'd been already been a fair bit of action going on in the day beforehand, and that's fairly important um, to the they, to the way the story unfolded. Very much like Midway, the way that um, it wasn't just one event that uh, saw the Japanese overwhelmed. It was a, a string of events, and the um, consequences of that string of events that uh, brought them to their knees. Um, with Illustrious, it was a fairly similar situation where she her aircraft had been in action since dawn, and the well, particularly Flieger Corps 10, but they were leading the op that day, knew this and they planned this, and they planned for Illustrious to be worn down by the time of their main attack. Okay, so it's, it was a, a constant series of attacks to presumably to, to string out the full Mars, to run them out of ammo, maybe damage or shoot some of them down before before the big event uh, shows it, it, up. Yeah, yes, in a roundabout way, yes. So from dawn, again, the shadowers began uh, to arrive. And yes, uh, Illustrious would be sending up her full Mars. So it's important to remember that at this point of the war, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, we're literally only... Uh, 13, 14 months into the war. Um, they had learnt a few lessons from uh, for carrier operations of Norway. They'd learnt that anti-aircraft guns weren't as effective as they thought they were. They'd learnt the uh, value of um, fighter direction from a guy with a chalkboard sitting in the signals office of uh, HMS Ark Royal attempting to uh, do fighter direction. So th these things had all been learnt in paper but weren't necessarily... Um, hadn't necessarily soaked their way through the entire fleet. So with uh, um, Illustrious, she was sitting between um, Valiant and Warspite. The Illustrious's uh, captain and command staff weren't really happy with this. They'd actually asked Admiral Cunningham for, them, for the carrier to be positioned some 30 uh, miles further south, a bit further away from the main fleet to give their radar operators a bit more time for warnings for incoming. But Cunningham was thinking, well, this is the famous illustrious. We've had nothing but trouble for so long. Um, we need a hero ship to make everyone feel better. So having illustrious in sight of the convoys and so forth, Cunningham thought was a, 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 an important boost for morale. So that, that sort of set things up um, to not be ideal for illustrious in the first place. But, you know, she went into the 10th um, doing her thing, uh, her swordfish. She had two squadrons of um, swordfish and one squadron of Fulmars, a reinforced squadron of Fulmars, which was 15 aircraft. So, again, that's another part of the whole early war situation where the, the thought was that the, the ideal mix for a carrier was one-third fighters, two-third bombers. Naturally, by the time you get to 1945, it's the opposite. It's either two-thirds fighters and one-third bombers or all fighter bombers. Um, but what worse than that, the Battle of Britain, six months earlier, had destroyed the Fleet Air Arms um, depot at Coventry. So they didn't have spare parts. They didn't have spare airframes. They only had what they had. And it was just about now that those spares were starting to run out. So by the time that Illustrious was in action on the 10th, her 15 full miles were down to 12. And she would send up flights of four to five full miles as part of her umbrella. And each time a flight went up, if a full mile got damaged or if something happened, it wasn't as easy to turn it around to get it back up again. 
so so there, there there's there's some underlying issues there with maintaining the the air cover yes and so that's you know a combination of uh, pilot fatigue but also aircraft fatigue because they simply couldn't um keep as many of them operational as they wanted so you know there was several uh, encounters with um uh shadowers one of, at least one of them from memory was shot down others came and went but um you know by the time uh it was noon they'd had a busy morning shall we say the swordfish had been sent off for a, an airstrike against a italian convoy that had been spotted and the full mars had been trying to disrupt anything that was over illustrious or the convoys and this was the scenario that the Flieger Corps 10 had anticipated and they decided to make it even and they had pre-planned to make it even more um, to exploit the situation even further so they sent in a flight of Italian torpedo bombers low level came in under the radar got detected very close to the fleet and naturally the the order went out you know dive 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 go and get these um, get these torpedo bombers the full Mars, I think there was four or five above the fleet at, the, at that time, um, traded their one big advantage, height, to get down low to try and disrupt these torpedo bombers. The torpedo bombers only turned out to be two. There wasn't a major attack, but, it was only, but those two was enough to pull the fighters down. The fighters were only able to engage those torpedo bombers after they dropped their torpedoes. And then the fighters fixated on those two torpedo bombers and chased it off towards uh, Pantarella, the island nearby, which was a, um, a small island nearby, which had an Italian airfield. So that drew the Fulmars down and it also drew them away from the fleet. Naturally, this was plan this being planned, as that was happening, the JU-87s and uh, Heinkels were launching and preparing, um, get getting in uh, form creating their formations over Sicily. So it was about quarter past 12 when these began to be picked up on radar and illustrious fighter control operators realized that uh, they were in trouble. So th this, this is, yeah, I mean, there, there's shades of midway, I think, to a certain extent there with the, with the fighters being drawn down to, to the low level to deal with torpedo bombers, um, thus opening the ship up for, for dive bomber attack. But as compared to Midway, where that all seems to have been a little bit of a happy accident, at least as far as the US Navy is concerned. In this case, this is actually a deliberate deliberate ploy by Flieger Corps 10 specifically to decoy away any fighter cover that the, the carrier might have before they go in with the big punch. Yes, it was definitely... Well, well apparently, the from my reading, um, I haven't actually been able to find many German documents myself, but... Um, Every indication from multiple sources is that, yes, it was part of a plan. You've got to remember that Flieger Corps 10 was Germany's specialist anti-shipping unit, and it was also the corps that was, had been planned to provide the aircraft and air crew for Graf Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. So they had a good idea of what they were doing, and they'd also been in practice. They'd, they'd also had uh, experience off Norway and in the North Sea, so they knew how to deal with moving ships and... They knew how to deal with fighter cover by this stage. So they put all that experience into effect. Then we get to now to the point when when the big formation start, starts arriving and the bombs start falling. So how... It's a little, what, bit, a little bit more even before that. So as you were saying with Midway, um, this is where, you know, at every point in the war up to here and after for, for several more years to come, this was where the pre-war war games were put to the test. This is where the doctrine that came out of those war, war games was put to the test. So here is Illustrious sitting between Valiant and Warspite. The Admiral is aboard, I think it was Valiant. And Valiant is therefore the flagship. So every time Illustrious wanted to turn into the wind to launch aircraft, it had to get permission from the flagship. Now, it's one of those things that you just... Don't, probably don't really realise the significance of until a situation like this arises. So the fighter control officers of um, Illustrious were frantically trying to get in touch with the, the flagship saying, look, we've got a replace... The, the, the cap was supposed to be replaced at 12.45. It's 12.15. We need to get the replacement cap up straight away. So that means we've got to turn into the wind half an hour earlier. 
Well, it took 15 minutes to get a response from the flagship. And that meant that those reserve fighters, which were on the deck, supplemented by a couple more, which were quickly pulled up from the hangar as they detected the uh, incoming raid, um, were sitting there warming up and Illustrious was waiting for permission to turn into the wind. Now, we you know, basically after this action, it, the carrier becomes the flagship regardless and it dictates when the, the fleets turn into the wind. But because of that, there was a delay in getting these slow climbing Fulmars into the sky. Okay, so then there, I, I believe at the time that the German formation shows up, there's there's still Fulmars trying to get off the deck at that point. They there there are there are Fulmars taking off, and there's also a replacement um, anti-submarine um, patrol of, of uh, swordfish as well. So literally, as the bombs um, first begin to burst ar around and on Illustrious, the last aircraft is taking off from her deck. So they there are. Um, several first-person accounts of the pilots of these aircraft saying you know, that they, they're they lifting off the front of the ship, they look over their shoulder and they see the first bomb hit Illustrious. One of them, uh, I believe it was a swordfish, was actually still on the deck, just powering past the island when the first bomb fell into the aft lift well, where, of course, that swordfish had just been sitting, uh, warming up its engine. That must have been fun. Um, yeah, I suppose it's, it's important to... Uh... To, to remember at this point, as you say, that we're not talking about Illustrious purely acting as a as the defence fighter defence carrier. She's in the middle of running fighter defence and anti submarine operations and maritime strike all at That's the same right. time, and she's yes. she's now having to perhaps refocus a little bit more on the self defence aspect. So so the bombs are starting to fall, and as you mentioned, the first one's hitting the lift. So. Roughly speaking, what what's the sequence of damage, and how 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 is this affecting the ship as as the bombs continue to to rain down? So it, it initially, it, essentially, it's about five bomb hits, all within the matter of one or two minutes. Um, it's this, this the situation is um, naturally somewhat chaotic. Um, but also not as bad as it could have been because uh, the, the fighters that had been sent off after the uh, two torpedo bombers had been recalled, but it was taking them time to get back. Uh, half of them had run out of ammunition. The other half had some ammunition left. Uh, they all get back as the, the attack is unfolding. Um, so you get, you've get you got full Mars diving into the um, JU-87s doing mock attacks because they haven't got any ammunition in the wild hope of scaring the shit out of the JU-87s and causing them to drop their bombs in order to escape. And that seems to happen on at least one or two occasions that the JU-87s are diverted from their attack by these unarmed formars. Um, down on the ship itself, it's attempting to evade, um, but the, the hits just um, come... You know, one after the other. One goes through the bow and explodes underneath the bow. It passes through the flight deck and explodes underneath the bow. That floods the forward section, starts fires in the forward section, in the paint lockers and the likes. Another lands immediately in front of the bridge. This is, appears to have been an anti-personnel bomb designed specifically to... Um, uh, well, intended specifically to kill anti-aircraft gunners, and it does that very well in this case. It destroys one of the... Uh, the octuple uh, um, pom pom mounts and um, jams the one in front of it. These are the two immediately in front of the bridge. Another passes through um, the pom pom mount on the side of the ship, on the, on the opposite side of the ship, uh, bounces off the side of the hull and explodes right alongside on the waterline. Um, and another one or two go into the aft world where one of the full Mars, which had failed to start, was going down the, um, the, the hangar back into going down the lift back into the hangar so that's that hit is probably where most of the early carnage came in yeah, it's pretty much and i know it's perhaps the term uh, lucky hit is a little bit overused in some circumstances but that is a that is a very lucky hit because you've got to hit the that the lift itself which in an, is a small percentage of the carrier's overall the deck space, the overall target area. And then not only have you hit the lift, you've hit the lift while there's an aircraft on it. And then not only have you hit a lift with an aircraft on it, you've also managed to hit one, get score hit just at the moment when that lift is on its way down and therefore it's not forming a seal with the with the armored uh, armored hangar 
with the part of the flight deck that's armored above the hangar. Um, and so the blast effect is much more easily translatable into the into the hangar itself. Yes, um, luck certainly plays a part in it because ultimately no less than three bombs go down that aft uh, hangar, uh, that aft lift well. Um, yeah, it's... It's frust- it would have been frustrating, I suppose, for it, on one level, because you've got this nice big armoured deck um, and you've got three, four, five bombs that hit just outside of that armoured deck. But you've also got to remember it's not just an armoured deck. What makes the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers different from any other aircraft carrier, including other armoured carriers, is that it's not an armoured deck as such, it's an armoured hangar. So it's got three inches of armour on the top, four and a half inches of armour on the side, and four and a half inch armoured roller doors to, uh, in front and behind the uh, forward and aft lifts. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's very much an enclosed box, effectively. Almost like almost like a That's battleship right, yes. citadel, but just slightly thinner and much higher. <laughs> That's right, yes. And it's it's also designed to protect the ship from the hangar as much as it's designed to protect the hangar from bombs. And that, and that make, yeah, I suppose that makes a lot of sense when you yeah, when you think about the kind of what damage well, A a hangar full of aircraft, explosives and fuel is gonna be quite quite the inferno, as would be seen later in the war on places like uh, Franklin and Bunker Hill. Um and even earlier than that. And in this case, uh, it was it was quite a, quite an inferno here as well. Yeah. So and this is why um, this is what this is what drew my interest to this in the first place was hearing or reading those comparisons one or two sentences too illustrious and thinking but hang on that doesn't make sense ha- ha- why was it so different for illustrious versus Franklin versus Bunker Hill versus Intrepid mm. and that's where you start to get into this. Uh, the, 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 you know, the doctrine of the armored box hangar. Right. So we, we we've taken taken the, the several hits. We've got f- a few going off in the in the lift well. So what what's now happening to illustrious with with all these hits going on? So um, basically, the, the, the explosions in the aft lift well, they don't have the armored ha- doors closed because they were in process of launching aircraft. Um, so again, it's that whole midway situation of not being as prepared as you'd like to be. Um, it, the blasts rip through the hangar, and the hangar is divided into three sections by uh, fire curtains. But these curtains are actually steel roller shutters. Again, it's one of those uh, instances where you suddenly realize, oh dear, this isn't as good an idea as we thought it was pre-war. Those steel shutters fragment and spear through the hangar um, in thousands of red hot splinters, um, cutting through aircraft, cutting through equipment, and um, cutting through hangar crew. Um, it was you know those hits which pretty much put um, Illustrious out of action as a carrier because of, of that the extent of damage. It, it also um, caused the forward lift to pop up, um, but it set off the fires and the aft hangar m- most intensely. But it was also about this point, after those first bombs went through the rear lift, that Illustrious's armour deck was itself pierced. Okay, so yeah, this is this is probably very important. So what exactly it's the the carrier with enough force to to blow through three and a half inches of deck plating because that's similar deck plating to what's present on a lot of battleships a lot of the older battleships at this period. Oh, this is where a lot of the confusion comes in, and I think the fault or the cause of this confusion is Britain's stricter secrecy uh, provisions post war. So immediately after the action when Illustrious makes it back to Malta, spoiler alert, mm-hmm. she makes it back to Malta, um, her captain sends off a damage report to the Admiralty in London. And in that damage report, he gives a fairly detailed list of what happened, but he blanket attributes all of the bomb hits to 1,000 pound, 500 kilogram bombs. And unfortunately, most historians have focused on that report. After Illustrious 
was uh, made her way to the United States. United States naval engineers went over the ship centimetre by centimetre, pulling out every piece of bomb fragment, every uh, measuring every bomb hole, doing the whole forensic analysis thing because they wanted to learn about the realities of war. So did the Royal Navy. And it wasn't a, a 1,000 kilogram bomb. Sorry, it wasn't a 1,000 pound bomb. It was a 1,000 kilogram bomb. 2,200 um, pound. The Germans have got a variety of that size. Generally, they're called ESOL, I think. Um, very big. A JU-87B could barely carry them. JU-88s could carry them. And there's video footage of them being uh, wheeled around the one runways in Sicily at that time. So we know that they were there. Mm. Um, it was one of these was, was, was dropped dead accurately on the center line, hit the deck. Must have been dropped quite low because its penetration wasn't as deep as would have been expected. Um, and it burst just above the uh, hangar floor, which was itself one inch armor um, stick plate, um, tore through that. And the, uh, subsequently, the, the fragments went through into the engine room, into the fuel tanks. Um, but most importantly, it um, destroyed and set on fire the four point the aft four point five inch conveyor belt for ammunition. Ah, now yeah, that's uh, that's that's a little bit concerning. Um, I suppose that, that that does make it does make sense in in terms of the overall obviously the clear expertise that Flieger Corp Ten has put into this attack. As you said, they've they've been dropping on um, anti personnel we weapons to take out the anti aircraft gunners. So it makes perfect sense that they would have deployed a variety of bombs presumably probably staggered in the order of their aircraft so that they can disrupt the illustrious ability to defend herself before then trying to land a, a knockout punch with heavier weapons that obviously say the the ju 87 is not quite as agile <clears throat> well it's not it's not the world's most agile or fast aircraft in the first place but stick a stick a one ton bomb under it and it's even worse so having that coming in maybe uh, a few a few aircraft down the line after some of the AA guns have been knocked out makes a lot of sense. And it appears that's exactly what happened because yeah, the, the initial hits do seem to have been uh, contact fused to, uh, to hit to explode on the deck. And as you say, the uh, big bomb was one of the one, one of the last ones. Again, we're only talking a matter of minutes, yeah. but still that's what it took for. The, you know, we're talking... 40, 50 um, JU-87s up there and high altitude Hunkels um, as well, um, you know, adding to the effect. So, yeah, it wasn't a minor raid um, by anyone's account. Yeah, and and obviously, yes, with, when you've got that many JU-87s from multiple squadrons, you can you can probably work out. Okay, this will be our heavy punch squadron. This will be our anti, our clear the deck squadron, and we'll make sure they dive first and things like that. Now, with with the um, the bomb detonating, obviously, as you say, fragments and explosion, uh, explosive effects do reach right down into the ship. What would likely have been the effect if the armored deck, uh, or the armored flight deck, hadn't been there? Because obviously, that almost certainly would have initiated the fuse on the bomb and slowed it down somewhat. Uh, so. So if that armor hadn't been present or maybe had been present on the on the hangar deck floor, how much further could that bomb have gotten and how much more well, I guess that, could it have done? I guess that's a $64 million question, isn't it? Um, mm. As you say, the, the difference here is, is that the, 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 the armor is up higher. So as you said, that slows the bomb down uh, higher. Um, in this instance, it detonated about three or four feet above the hangar deck. Um, so, and that's because, you know, I guess that is because of the, um, it being slowed, that fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that if the, the three inch deck was on the hangar deck, it would have had a, a good chance of, if not penetrating that deck, at least um, detonating in that deck, in that um, deck. So, Look, I, 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 my personal non-engineer perspective is, is that, yes, it probably would have breached and, and detonated in the, um, maybe the wardroom underneath, not, maybe probably not the actual engine spaces themselves, but if it, if it exploded in the wardroom underneath the hangar, then there's only your standard sort of bulkhead steel between it and the, the, um, the, the bowels of the ship. 
Yeah, so potentially a lot more explosive effect being then vented down through. And again, you know, this is a one thousand kilogram bomb. It's it's um, a little bit deceptive in that in that a lot of that weight is in its um, hardened casing, so mm -hmm. it's explosive. So its warhead isn't isn't necessarily massive, but it certainly me means that that the warhead that it does have gets delivered to where you want it to be, um, yeah. whereas a Whereas a 500-pound um, bomb contact fuse that detonates on the deck, very thin casing, but a lot of explosive for the for the blast effect. So almost like the difference between armor-piercing and high-explosive battleship shells. Very much so. Exactly the same um, concept, exact same principle, exact same physics, yes. This is uh, sort of the the big hit as it were so and as we said we, that that's hit the that's gone through to the engine spaces so what happens to illustrious now presumably it's losing speed okay well it's, it's only fragments that go to the engine spaces so the engines mm -hmm. actually are, are actually okay um okay so the, the there's there's not a lot going on there um the engine spaces are filling with smoke there are fires raging on the decks above the engine engine spaces and very quickly we're talking you know, 60 degrees centigrade, I'm not sure what that is, uh, Fahrenheit, uh, temperatures. So you've got um, crews basically having to douse themselves in water from the distillers to keep themselves going. Um, some of them are passing out in the heat. All of them are ordered to stay at the station, keep the ship going. So, you know, it, it's... Illustrious manages to maintain 25 knots, if not more, pretty much the whole action. But the intensity of the hits in the stern um, lift well uh, and several near misses right on the stern as well causes the rudder space to flood. So the 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 the, the um, main uh, rudder control room, rudder power room, floods and illustrious loses uh, control, loses power to her rudder. Uh, the, <laughs> so yeah, so that... the, as the attack is unfolding, so there's there are still follow up attacks at this point, mm -hmm. and uh, she, she's lost control. So she's having to. Frantically put up the uh, signals, you know, um, I'm not under control uh, to warn uh, Valiant and Warspite to get out of her way. Right, yeah. And of course, with, with the rudder disabled, that makes evasion a little bit more difficult as well. Yes. <laughs> um, it's a situation where they get it going again for a short bit of time through a basic damage control. Then they lose control after five or 10 minutes. They turn on the auxiliary. Um, motors for the rudder, which is steam powered, they also fail after a few minutes. So what eventually happens is they get it going long enough to jam the rudder amidships so that it's not turning the ship left or right or starboard or port, and they are then able to, to um, steer the ship on um, engine alone. So but by var varying the screw speeds on the yeah. different sides. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that occupies them for at least an hour <clears throat> trying to get steerage back. So there's a bit of a lull here um, after that major attack, um, but there's you know there are still more reconnaissance coming and going. Her full Mars could not land because there's a great big crater where the aft lift was, and the front lift is buckled upwards. So Illustrious has the capacity to land aircraft over the bow, but not in this instance because the forward lift is a a roadblock. So they are diverted, and and also the surviving the uh, swordfish that are up they they divert to Malta where they refuel and come back um, when, when possible to provide what measure of cap they can. Okay, so the, although the, the carrier itself is disabled, the air group is still doing something to, to, to try and defend it against possible follow-ups. Yeah, so I think there was somewhere between seven and eight of her full Mars were up in the air at the time that she was disabled. And uh, most of those get to Malta uh, where they, you know, Commonality. They just uh, strap it, pack in the 303 ammunition from, which is uh, the same as being used by the hurricanes there at that time. Um, refuel, um, grab a drink of water, and fly back. Um, they provide patchy cover for the rest of the afternoon. Okay, and of course, the the important thing is that after this lull, the the trouble for illustrious doesn't end after this main attack wave is over, does it? That they keep coming no. back. So you've got. The ship that's uh, it's still uh, the fire is largely contained to the hangar, largely contained to the aft end of the hangar because Illustrious has 
three sets of uh, salt water sprayers inside uh, the hangar. So the aft set is, is knocked out by the bomb hit, but the middle set and the forward set are activated by the um, uh, action station personnel. Um, most of the hangar crew are dead, a few get out. Um, and this is when they naturally are they're fighting the fires. They're trying to stop the fires from spreading to the rest of the ship. Um, there's some concern about the fires in the forward in the bow because they're not far from the forward um, 4.5 inch uh, magazines and the fire in the back of the ship is pretty much out of control and it's fairly hard for anyone to get back there because it's just a tangled ma a mass of steel so all through this time illustrious manages to maintain electrical power most of the time except for a few scary flickers um, the telephone network which is run through um uh it, armored trunking inside the ship is also still mostly working so the damage control personnel are able to keep in touch with their different uh, parties um, and the ship is doing the best it can to get to Malta but as you say um, the Luftwaffe who initially thought that it would just take four bomb hits to sink Illustrious have just seen five bomb hits and she's not sinking so they they are out for her blood and yes, there's uh, several more follow-up attacks. One by the Italian um, Stukas, uh, which presses its attack. It's not as coordinated as the initial attack, which is pretty much just as well. Um, but they still managed to land another bomb hit in the aft lift well. <laughs> they might as well have painted a bullseye on that thing, <laughs> the way this is going. Well, yeah, there, there, there must have been a magnet underneath it or something. Um, but that that explosion, unfortunately, kills a large number of the damage control personnel fighting the fires in the hangar. Um, and another explosion, a near miss from this attack, kills a lot of the uh, damage control plus medical personnel on the ship's quarter deck, um, at the very stern of the ship, uh, treating patients and also attempting to control the fires back there. Okay. So she she's still under attack, but as you said earlier, spoiler alert, she does actually make it to Malta. Um, yes, so it's, 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 con it's, it's, so it's you know, for, for, for the for the rest of the afternoon, you know, from this all started about quarter past twelve. For the rest of the afternoon, there's high altitude attacks from you know Heinkels or Italian bombers. There's a couple of um, attacks from Stukas, and yeah, she's. But she's still motoring along at 25 knots and still able to steer. She's got a couple of destroyers in accompaniment. Uh, Valiant and Warspite stay for a good amount of time before they have to break off and go and look after the rest of the convoy. But uh, even as she's pulling into Malta and, and the sun is pretty much going below the horizon, there's another attack um, or attempted attack by two aircraft. They're not seen. Um, by this point, you know, after the initial bomb attack, there's only the forward 4.5-inch uh, mounts working and half of her pom-poms. They sort of get an idea as to where these um, bombers are, lay down a barrage, and successfully scare it off. So then, you know, it's, it, there, there's, there's Valletta Harbour. She gets pulled in. She's still burning, burning heavily. And, you know, there are reports from the, the Maltese standing on the dock that they could see her aft hole glowing orange from the heat Eek. that's uh that's quite quite a bit of temperature because as you say the the uh the hull is the hangar is armored so that's a lot of heat to uh to build up to to make a four and a half inch thick belt glow <laughs> i'm not sure if that's that the, 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 there was also heavy <coughs> fire behind the aft lift so mm -hmm. around the um, quarter deck and the rudder spacer so it, it could have been there but um yes look we, we the there were four three or four full mars in the, the back part of the hangar and there was a lot of spare stores and components in the roof of the hangar and these continued to burn um until about three o'clock in the morning um it took that long even with the help of the uh, dockyard to put the fire out in the aft hangar but it was contained to that space by that those that four and a half inches of steel on the sides um and the, the the sprinklers in the forward section of the hangar in fact 
apparently the swordfish at the front end of the hangar, apart from having a few holes torn in them from the flying splinters, were able to be returned to service at a later date. Okay. That's uh, that's quite interesting. Um, so she, she's in Malta now, um, but as, as I understand it, they, the Germans aren't giving up. Even the sunset, there's a new day. She's being repaired in Malta, um, but they're still trying to finish the job. Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of you know, shouting going on. Um, why has this ship not sunk um, after being hit you know, six or seven times by this stage? Um, so at this point, Flieger Corps 10 isn't really prepared to attack Malta because it's only just arrived in, that part in January. Um, and its specific uh, mission initially was to go for the illustrious. So they have to spend a day getting themselves organized, and prepared, briefed on, on Malta. Um, Illustrious's crew gets taken off. Um, only her gunners remain on board. And a lot of very courageous um, Maltese dockyard workers are desperately trying to shore up the back of the ship, desperately trying to get through the hot steel to find out what's wrong with the rudder and patch up the holes in her stern and in her bow. Um, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want to be a, a diver in the water with bombs falling into the water around you. Um, but that's what these people were doing to guarantee that they could get Illustrious up and running again as quickly as possible. Okay, so yeah, that's um, con continued action for Illustrious, even though the even though she's actually in harbour. Yes, yeah, so, so it's it's a, a constant bombardment. Um, not, not constant, it's, there's waves of bombardment. Uh, so uh, HMAS Perth, Australian light cruiser, was tied up opposite. And you know, she was, there are, uh, her accounts of the attacks are just fairly extraordinary of, of the Stukas diving through the dust and the, um, the bombers just carpet bombing the area, trying to get her. One large bomb detonates right alongside of Illustrious and caves in a large part of her side and another bomb lands right on the stern again so at this point the illustrious stern is basically only hanging in place by a few electrical cables probably because it's just been hit so many times i was seriously concerned at, at its uh, at its um structural integrity so multi dockyard workers frantically tried to you know brace it up as quickly as they could uh, but those two hits again, you know, weren't critical. Um, they hurt. They fractured a lot of uh, fuel tanks. They knocked engines out of their mountings. They set new fires in the stern. But the ship had been evacuated at this point, and nothing desperate it was broken. Okay. So then, with, with that, presumably they <clears throat> they managed to patch the ship back into some form of, of seaworthy state, but she obviously can't stay there and Malta's not equipped to completely refit her anyway. So no, she... so this is basically the first Malta Blitz. It was called the Illustrious Blitz, and it's the first mm -hmm. uh, of the you know, of what was to come for the next two or three years. You know, attack after attack after attack on the town, the harbour, the shipping, anything, uh, the, the, the airfields. It was, it was the start of the whole, uh, or the, the high intensity attacks on Malta. So yeah, after several days, they get Illustrious up to a point where she can um, she's watertight, and they she, she's got she's detailed to head out to sea and meet up with some cruisers and get an escort back to Alexandria. Uh, so she races out of harbour at high speed uh, in such a hurry that apparently she didn't even bother to haul in the uh, mooring lines, and makes her way out at uh, you know twenty five twenty six knots. Uh, so fast that she bypassed her escort and continued to race on towards Malta. Um, fortunately, because she was moving so fast, she wasn't spotted. She hasn't got operational aircraft at this point. She's basically just a, a, a moving hulk. Um, she races along, but I think the engineers sort of pushed it a bit too hard and she has a bit of a breakdown, uh, which, which would have been a bit nerve wracking for a while. They realize that um, most of her bunker oil is contaminated. Uh, they frantically try and uh, clear some of those bunkers, get rid of some of the water. Um, eventually, she pulls into Alexandria Harbour with no less, no more than 60 tonnes worth of um, 
uh, usable oil fuel aboard. In terms of um, you know tense, dramatic actions, uh, you know, this this is right up there. From it's just it's just relentless day after day after day of survival, um, of action, of of uh, combat through to mechanical uh, challenges. The the story of the illustrious is is extraordinary, and it's really quite quite incomprehensible that it's uh, not uh, a much more celebrated tale. Yeah, it's um, it's certainly certainly a, a tale of significant endurance, and of course the fact that, as you say, despite the fact of having basically had her stern near enough blown into oblivion, she's able to still head out under her own power to to Alexandria, and thence obviously round round the entirety of Africa to uh, America for her final repairs. When she does make it uh, from Alexandria via via the Suez Canal to states for her repairs. This is obviously where the the more full evaluation of the damage that we mentioned earlier was conducted. So what what's the outcome of this repair and presumably refit that she gets and roughly how quickly is she back in action? So it takes a fair while to get her to the United States, several months. Um, once she gets to the United States, of course the United States doesn't have a plans. Um, it's not easy for Norfolk Navy Yard to repair her because you've got to remember the British use just different standards of everything from bolts, bolt styles to thread styles to fittings to attachments. They have their own set of standards, which is not the same set of standards as the United States Navy. So everything has to be adapted on the fly. Her plans have to be flown out. Uh, they have to, you know, there's, it's, it's not like they have the templates for any of the equipment there to, or the to build from so it's it's a fairly yeah it's not as fast as you would like necessarily because it's, it's fairly bespoke work i suppose for uh, the united states navy navy yards but they do an incredibly fast job they do an incredibly good job um and you know she's back um in action oh i, I think it's, it's after after she gets to norfolk it's pretty five or six months i think before she's back in the united states from memory I, i'll have to double check that but um it, it often it often seems like a lot longer because people don't take into account the transit time it took to get her there from Alexandria and for then for her to get back from the United States to the UK. Mm. Um, but it still is a longer uh, repair time than say uh, you know uh, a, a US carrier being hit in the Pacific because it's just not they, they just don't have the equipment to do the job. But there's also another reason for it. This is the first major carrier battle of the war involving dive bombers and the like where they've got forensic evidence that they can analyze so there's an awful lot to be learned from this action and there's no doubt about it that the u.s navy and the royal navy engineers did everything they could to learn from this action so you will see on my website the uh, i've reproduced um, the damaged the extensive after action uh, um, damage control report that was formed in norfolk naval yard uh, extensive photographs which show you just the extent of the damage inside the ship, how the stern is just basically a twisted mess, um, and the drawings showing all the, diff the different uh, angles and locations and uh, extent of damage. Be and, and they did this because they needed to learn. They needed to learn what to expect next, and Illustrious provided that in spades. Her, you know, her gunnery officers were cross-examined in great detail about what was it like facing dive bomber attacks. This is one, you know, this is the first dive bomber attack against an aircraft carrier at, at, of any point. Um, you know, the the um, merits of the the the, the hangar, the, the fire curtains, you know, the were all all re-examined. So after this, the fire curtains got stripped out of all, all the British carriers and were replaced with asbestos fabric. Okay, so the, if the Whereas the uh, steel would kill you instantly, the asbestos would just destroy your lungs the rest of your life. But <laughs> at least they wouldn't shatter from the compression of an explosion. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it also proved a lot of Royal Navy doctrine, such as draining fuel fuel lines. There were no out, at no point was there an out of control fuel fire, even though the ship was on fire from bow to stern, essentially. Um, you know, the, the Royal Navy carriers wasted 
a lot of people say, an awful lot of space by encapsulating its fuel, aviation fuel canisters in tanks full of seawater. Well, that was in order to stop shock from explosions transmitting into the um, aviation fuel con containers. And also, if the aviation fuel did um, uh, breach, then it was go f going into a, a an area already full of liquid, so it wouldn't disperse as rapidly. So mm -hmm. none of those th things were... Um, all those things worked. And I've just been shot by my daughter again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, my, my daughter likes to shoot me with a Nerf, a Nerf gun whenever I'm doing these podcasts. Um, yeah, things like um, you know that the, the the value of the spray, the saltwater spray, is in the hangars. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. so it meant that they had to clean the radios and, and the like. But the fires, as wild as they were in the aft hangar, did not extend forward. Again, you know, um, allowing the ship's crew to get, to rally and fight back. Um, the way that the the whole the layers of the protection in the hull kept the engine room um, pretty much space for everything but this, a, a few small splinters that we got through to fuel to the oil fuel tanks. Um, yeah, the, all these measures worked. Oh, and as I mentioned before, the explosion on the um, four point five inch conveyor belts well, that itself was armoured, and ultimately, in the intensity of the heat, only one four point five inch shell detonated in that space. Um, whereas it could have been so much worse if the rest of the conveyor section had, had lit up. So hmm. it, 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 while there's an awful lot of weight in that equipment, in this particular uh, worst-case scenario, it um, demonstrated that, yes, um, it, it, it could save a ship. Yeah, and I suppose that's the thing, isn't it? It's the, the, ship is, the ship survives, and the ship survives in a state that it's repairable and can be returned to the front lines. And, you know, uh, Elastrius was there until the end, fighting in um, uh, off Okinawa, um, having a, even had a kamikaze clip it. Um, unfortunately, the detonation of the uh, kamikaze in the water alongside of Elastrius sort of reopened some of those wounds from the, the bent frames, the, the cracked frames, uh, and caused it to start to vibrate fairly seriously. So at that point, once uh, Formidable arrived, she was sent back home. But even then, she was able to maintain station shaking crazily until her relief vessel arrived. Mm. I suppose that's the thing, isn't it? At the end of the day, she she's back in action. She, she sees out the rest of the war, as we said, and she manages to put in a lot of good service in between uh, this attack and and obviously her subsequent encounter with kamikazes later on. I, I, yes, I, I, the thing is, is that um, you've got to remember that um, Britain at this point is under siege. Um, you've got U-boats sinking as much shipping coming in as that can. You've got bombers attacking its industrial centres. Um, it can't mass produce carriers like um, the United States can. Um, it attempts to do so with the light fleet carriers, but you know even those are delayed. So it needs what it's got to go the distance, and I, I think that's probably part of the reasoning behind these ships is um, to the knowledge that um, they can't be replaced quickly. So we need to keep them going as long as we can. Um, that and the yeah. fact that, as um, uh, Dr. Alexander Clark was saying the other day. They were designed also to fight in the Pacific, which is half a world away from its supply support base, support facilities. So it had to be able to fight in the Pacific, survive in the Pacific, and get home from the Pacific if necessary. Yeah, and I suppose the the, the fact that the the Japanese tended to carry somewhat lighter bombs than a than a thousand kilogram armor piercing unit probably would have stood them yeah. in fairly good stead at that point. Well, when 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 Illustrious was designed in. Uh, 36, I think it was, the standard bomb being used by all the world was 500 pounds. Um, the Royal Air Force said, oh, we'll never carry anything bigger than that against a ship because of range. Well, naturally, engine power is developing so quickly. Um, they were soon proven wrong. But you know, again, it's, it's, it's a strategic game where if you've got an armoured deck, you know you have to carry a bigger bomb. Thus, the Ju-87 carrying the 1,000-kilogram bomb, 2,200 pounds. Um, but it could only carry that in a short radius, and that radius was barely Malta. Mm -hmm. So it's only because Illustrious went that close to Malta 
that it exposed itself to that weight of bomb. If Elastrius was further out, she would have only been in range of the JU-87Rs, which could only carry 500 um, pound bombs. So it's, it, it, this is the trade-off that um, is inherent in any form of um, naval doctrine, or air, air doctrine for that matter. Hmm. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a trade off how, as you say, how closer you get to the enemy, the more they can throw at you. <laughs> but That's I right. at the same time, you, you, you can then get closer to the enemy in this case. Um, I mean, yeah, you don't come out of it without a few scars, but you'd, at least it's not the bottom of the sea. Well, there's no doubt that Cunningham made a mistake here in sending Lastrius that close. Um, but like you say, I don't think he was expecting uh, anyone to be carrying a uh, 1,000 kilogram bomb uh, at that point. Yeah, and I suppose at the same time, as, as well as obviously, well, the, the, there's a, there's a lot to be said for the durability and uh, capability of the illustrious. A, a fair bit has to be put. Um, a fair bit of credit has to go to the commanders and pilots of Flieger Corp Ten who set up uh, this multi-stage, very complicated. I might add, multi-stage attack, multiple t forms of ammunition uh, and payload, specifically geared to taking down the defences um, and then hitting. A carrier like this very hard and obviously they, they didn't quite succeed in putting it down but uh, they certainly put it back in which was needed there's no doubt about that um yeah it would have been, i'm sure that cunningham would have loved to have had two fleet carriers um in the following year but he only had formidable um and mm. yeah if if illustrious had been there with formidable at matapan well it might have been a much a different outcome there so you know it's uh yeah it is there's there's multiple layers of um, success and a defeat involved in, in these things. Uh, a mission kill is often just as valuable as a, you know, a hard kill. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's it, although obviously she would have still been hit, but it's, it's probably relatively safe to say she wouldn't have been quite as badly off if it had been the kind of uh, general swarming attack with 500, with sort of general purpose and semi-armor piercing 500 pounders which is what everyone expected and which was quite often the case in a number of other carrier engagements when dive bombers came into play uh yeah for sure but um again it, it's just so hard to say isn't it you know uh hmm. her, it, her entire deck wasn't armored it was only the area containing the uh you know the volatiles so you know that she still had you know as was shown in this action that she had achilles heel the stern was torn up her bow was hurt but it wasn't you know done in um so you look yeah it, all it takes is just a lucky hit and i think that happened you know that's evidenced in in so many actions it just everything just depends on where that bomb or that shot lands and in this instance um several bombs landed exactly where Flieger core 10 would have loved them to mm -hmm. um however a few too many landed in the one spot <laughs> they probably would have liked those bombs to have scattered themselves around a bit further around the ship. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, so there's only so much you can kill in one part of a ship before everything's dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's that's pretty pretty comprehensive. I think very interesting, and obviously with pointing out both uh, how she ended up in the situation she did and and the out aftermath of it. So once again, thank you very much for lending your time and support for for this video and. Great fun. I'm more than happy to do so again. There's uh, plenty of other actions and uh, um, you know, damage reports and the like for the Royal Navy's um, fleet carriers. Uh, equally interesting and equally um, forgotten, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be coming back to this at, uh, at some point in the future. And for obviously for those of you who uh, haven't visited his website, as I said earlier, please do. Um, Armoured Carriers. Uh, there'll be a link in the de the description, and also be linking through to the to the YouTube channel, uh, which has quite a number of very interesting uh, videos with using uh, narrated accounts from the survivors of various engagements, which is very definitely worth a watch. So please do uh, go watch and su subscribe and such like, uh, because we need as much naval history, good good reliable naval history as we can um, on the out in the various media formats and this is that's definitely one of them and thank you very much for your fantastic work as well it's uh, been a pleasure following your material for the uh, past year, couple of years so um uh, keep it up thank you very much i fully intend to and uh, yeah so for everyone who's listening i hope you enjoyed that and i uh, hope to see you again in another video thank you bye
that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.